Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago over in the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 15, we just read verses 22 through 27. My quick review, as you know, we're in the middle of looking at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings, and we're seeing a lot of different types of conflict going on. Not merely the murmuring and the complaining, which comes from the flesh of the Jews who were griping against Moses, and indeed uh, God killed them after ten times of doing that. But we also discovered that there is a great deal of demonic attack and satanic influence as we were looking through these different passages. Now we're nearing the completion of rebellion test number four, which was at Rephidim, which was actually a replay of test number two, if you recall, because both of those tests deal with water. The first was walking by faith for water. And here we find Rephidim is where Amalek attacked Israel. And God declared that he would have a perpetual war with Amalek from generation to generation. And so we've been discussing the connection between warfare and prayer. Prayer is essential for the believer who is engaged in spiritual warfare. Just like God's war with Amalek from generation to generation, and it continues down to the present, even so spiritual warfare against Satan and his demons is for the community of Christians from generation to generation as well. Central to all of that for the believer, of course, is the work of the Holy Spirit. So we saw that Rephidim is about warfare and prayer because it was at Rephidim that Israel fought the Amalekites while Aaron and Hur supported Moses' hands in prayer as Joshua won that great victory over Amalek in Exodus 17. So what are some of the principles that we've learned thus far which compare and parallel what we see in Ephesians 6? What we've learned so far is number one, in spiritual warfare, Satan, the enemy, will attack you no matter what you're doing, just like Amalek attacked Israel. But always he will attack you when you are walking by faith and when you're in the center of doing the will of God. Number two, as in most warfare, there is a division of assignments. There's a selection of troops. There are those who are sent as frontline warriors. There's a chain of command. There's logistical support. It all happens in warfare. Number three, and this is so important, every subordinate officer must fulfill his role if there is to be victory. We saw all the different subordinates in that scenario there. Some of them had rather dull roles, like Joshua and Hur. Headquarters must all, always be kept apprised of what is going on on the battlefield. And of course, that's our communication through prayer, and Paul talks about that after he discusses the spiritual armor in Ephesians chapter 6. Number five, there are always definite and doable steps to secure a victory. If you leave anything out, you are guaranteed that you will have defeat. Number six, you can't make up on your, your own rules for spiritual warfare. Lifting up hands in scripture is a symbol of intercessory prayer. Without prayer, with prayer there is victory, without prayer there is defeat. And then one that I have emphasized for a couple of weeks, never forget, leaders get tired too. Moses sat, he had to sit. He couldn't stand there any longer holding his own hands up. Aaron and Hur had to do it for him. Number eight, nobody is exempt from spiritual warfare faced by this church. And number nine, Joshua got the credit for the victory, but it's actually a team effort. You know, we talk about such and such a great and mighty pastor and such. Listen, everyone, there's team effort behind it. Just remember that. You cannot win a football game with a quarterback only. You have to have a team. And if you've got the best quarterback in the world and the team is sitting on the sidelines licking lollipops, you're going to lose. It's a team effort, and that's true in the church. Every one of us is important. That means you personally are important to the success of the spiritual battle of this church. So we looked at Ephesians 6, and 
that really is the Christian's Guide to Spiritual Warfare based on prayer because that is a capstone of that discussion as you look at Ephesians chapter 6. But we saw that in the first verse, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, we notice two things. Number one, the armor and prayer are indispensable to spiritual warfare. And number two, the strength is not our own, but it says his power and might. That is, the power provided by the Holy Spirit of God. And then verse 11 says, put on the whole armor that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In other words, you can't ignore any part of the armor. That means you can't downplay the essential need also for both individual and corporate prayer because this was written to a church. Soldiers don't fight wars alone. They fight in an army. There are two armies in every conflict, at least two. Many times there are many different, but at least two have got to be in conflict. They're not a bunch of freewheeling agents doing their own thing independently. When we look at my brethren in Ephesians 6, that's a group. That's a reference to corporate prayer, not just individual prayer. Number two, although each soldier faces specific soldiers from the enemy side, and we often have to do it in hand-to-hand combat, we have to fight side by side so that we're not overwhelmed by the enemy. Number three, remember when soldiers fight, they are at the same location and at the same time. That's the point of the church gathered for prayer, soldiers side by side. There are at least three guaranteed serious consequences for the, for the kind of soldier who refuses to come to the battle. Some people say, well, you know, let somebody else do it. I'm busy in the mess hall. I want to have another sandwich. Well, don't rouse me with reveille. I don't get up at 5 o'clock. That's too early. Yeah, yeah, but the enemy's approaching. Call me at 9. I like to get up at 9. There are three guaranteed serious consequences if you're that kind of a soldier. <clears throat> or when you refuse to come to battle. Or when you're always late for the battle, in that case, corporate prayer. Number one, that kind of soldier puts his fellow soldiers at risk of death, thus risking the safety and defeat of the larger unit. Number two, he puts himself at risk of death because he is a highly visible, open target as he moves across the battlefield alone and doesn't have anybody else covering his back if he gets attacked by multiple enemy soldiers at once. And number three, he puts himself in serious jeopardy with the commander-in-chief because he is willfully refusing to follow orders. The enemy may be unlawful, but the commander-in-chief has the lawful authority to put the miscreant soldier to death if his negligent sloth and personal comfort jeopardize or cause the death of his fellow soldiers. We apply that to prayer in the church. That's how Paul applies it in Ephesians chapter 6. That's how we see a practical illustration given for us in Exodus chapter 17 with Amalek. Knowing theology is irrelevant if there is no personal application. I've said it before, I'll say it probably many times if the Lord gives me life. The church is not here for your personal pleasure when it is convenient to come. The church is here for your protection and God put you here to protect the other soldiers in this church. You need to be here for prayer meeting to accomplish both of those goals. Why? For we wrestle not, verse 12, against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, the devil doesn't like wrestling. He likes murder. But wrestling is used as the illustration for how we do battle because we can't kill Satan and his demons. But they can kill you. You know, in wrestling, the goal is to beat your opponent <laughs> and, if possible, pin him to the mat. And all you have to do to win the match is win by one point. That's all. If the devil beats you by one point, he wins. You're wrestling not against flesh and blood, although the devil uses people. You're wrestling against four different levels of spiritual military powers 
principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's a hierarchy of military terms, and it gives you the picture of a well-organized, highly mobile, deadly, powerful, and swiftly connected military command. The devil and his demons are not a bunch of neighborhood thugs. They are very organized. They have a specific strategy. They have resources and organizational skills. They don't work independently. They work to accomplish a common goal, which is the defeat of every Christian alive on planet Earth, including you and me. And they use real people to do it. But the devil's goal is to stop the spread of the gospel worldwide and to kill the messengers if possible. And we just read about one of those brothers who has just been killed in a prison in Pakistan because he stood for the gospel of Christ and was charged with blasphemy against, against Islam. The devil will kill you if he can. Just remember that. That's the struggle you're in. It's a serious struggle. Most of the time we sort of, you know, don't think about that here in America because everything is so comfortable and we are just so cushy. Whether you like it or not, you are in a death struggle with the powers of darkness. Now on May 6th, now of course uh, last week was Mother's Day, so we weren't talking about this last week, but on May 6th we started looking at the fourfold division of the angelic military sections that Paul mentions. Principality, the first word that's used there, RK, the first ones, that's used by Paul of angels and demons who were invested with power. And we saw a wonderful encouragement in Romans chapter 8. Paul's asking a question, can anything separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. It's written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long, we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors, at Pernicon, through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, now here's that first word, that first military term that Paul used in Ephesians 6. Nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We find it translated by the word rule over in 1 Corinthians 15 where he is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ when he raises us from the dead and then when he delivers up the kingdom to God and it says even the Father when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. All of those four things that Paul lists which are currently fighting against us and why you and I must wear the spiritual armor all of it at all times in all places Jesus will crush them all and deliver the kingdom up to God the Father. Ephesians chapter 1, it tells us where Jesus Christ sits now that he has risen from the dead. And it talks about all the incredible inheritance that we have. And it says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in heavenly places, as Ephesians 1, 20 and 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Jesus is Lord. And someday, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, including the knees of the devil. God will crack his knees, force him to the ground, and make him confess, Jesus is Lord. And every one of the demons in all four of those echelons of power, he will break their knees and make them bow and force them to confess, Jesus is Lord. He crushed the head of the serpent. The serpent may have bitten his heel. Genesis 3.15. But he crushes the head of the serpent. He is Lord. And dear people, that's the one who's your savior. That's the one who delivers you from the enemy. 
That's the one to whom we pray. The picture of Moses' hands raised over Amalek as Israel fought below. The picture that Paul gives of spiritual warfare in Ephesians chapter 6. Visual picture in Rephidim. Spiritual picture, Ephesians chapter 6, but it's talking about the same thing. Ephesians chapter 3. Paul talks a lot about it in the book of Ephesians. He's talking about our fellow heirship of the covenant promises that God has provided in Christ by the gospel. And Paul talks about how God made him a minister of that and gave him the gift of grace for doing that. Even though he was the least of all the saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, as Ephesians 3, 9 now, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. And then the next verse. God is teaching angels and demons by the way he works with the church. Look at verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is revealing incredible things about his predestinating and electing purposes his sovereign overriding purpose for eternity, he is teaching the angelic hosts on both sides of the warfare, he is teaching them his glory by the church. That means he's teaching them through you and me. What his sovereign purpose is like. And even the highest echelon, the principalities, have things to learn by the way God deals with you and with me. We are nothing. We are less than nothing. We're little sand mites crawling around on the beach. And God says, I want you to know my wisdom. Take that little thing and put it under a microscope and look at it. Say, wow. Like those little water bears. Like all these incredible things that you see through the microscope. And you suddenly begin to realize the awesome, infinite power of God with little things. And we are little things. God chooses the off-scourings of the world, world is what Paul says. The things that are nothing the base things of the world, the refuse, the trash, if you will, to prove how great he is. And we stand in awe and in wonder that he would care about us. Friends, do you get it? God loves you. When I look at myself, I think, why would he want to love me? We have a wonderful God. He's infinitely wonderful. He's our Savior, and he is our Lord. He is our protector. He has already determined the day of our death. It may come at the hands of Satan and his wicked host. It may come at the hands of those whom he controls and motivates. But it will be for the glory of God. And we know that all things work together for good. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Are you called according to his purpose? What did Paul say? Neither height nor depth nor angels nor principalities. Nothing can keep you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He is Lord. Ephesians chapter 3. 
to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the same word that's used over there in Ephesians 12, uh, 6, 12, where it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. God is teaching the principalities by the way in which he deals in our lives to show them his sovereign purpose and his grace and his goodness and his love and his kindness to us. We find it again over in Colossians, which of course the book of Colossians has many things that are parallel to the book of Ephesians. When you read those two epistles through, you discover Wow, there's a lot of parallel between Colossians and Ephesians. But we find down here, speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, it says, For by him were all, verse 16, all things created. That takes you back to John 1.1. 1, 1. That takes you back to Genesis 1. All things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. That means he not only created the stuff you can see, the physical world, he created the spirit world also, the things that are invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, and here's our word, or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That's a fascinating word. That means they're all glued together. That's why we don't blow apart with atoms splitting all around us and blowing us to smithereens. Jesus is the one that holds it all together. If he's the creator of heaven and earth and all things that therein are, if he's creator of all the physical realm, and we will someday give account to him, we will someday be judged by him. The Bible is very clear on that so will the spirit realm because that's what it says here all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers even the highest ranking echelon of angels and boy i tell you the devil's forces are you know out in force against god they don't want to come to that day. They are resisting it as much as they can. They're trying to get as many followers on earth as they possibly can. They're trying to kill God's followers off. They're trying to win the war. They are not going to win the war because Christ died and crushed the head of the serpent. But they haven't given up. Years ago, I heard a story about a number of years after World War II, a remote atoll in the Pacific where... It was unknown up to that point that there was a, a group of Japanese soldiers who had been stationed there to defend against the Allied invasion, and they did not know that the end of the war had come. And so someone went for some purpose to that island and was being shot at by these Japanese soldiers, and then they found out that that's what was there, this small handful of aging Japanese soldiers waiting for the invasion, and they thought that this was the American invasion. And so they finally found the commander of those soldiers who went to the island and convinced them that the war was over and that Japan had lost and that they could put their weapons down. You know, it's, the war was over. The emperor had signed the surrender, but they were still fighting the war. Folks, that's what the devil is like. He's out there still fighting the war. The war is really over. Jesus won the war at Calvary. He guaranteed the victory by the resurrection. But the devil doesn't want to give up. And those who follow him don't want to give up. And they will still shoot at you if they can. But the war has been won. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2, we find the word twice in chapter 2. In verse 10 and in verse 15, it says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him, that is, in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
I love this verse. This is one of the great verses for demonstrating the theological truth of the deity of Christ. For in him, that is in the Lord Jesus Christ, he's your nearest antecedent, for in him dwelleth all, not part, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That is God in the flesh. No diminishing of him. It may be veiled, but it is not diminished. Jesus is fully God in the flesh. You want to memorize Colossians 2.9. People say, well, I don't believe Jesus was really God. He, I mean, he thought he was God. Or I don't really believe that Paul taught that Jesus was God. Uh, uh, I don't think that Jesus himself thought he was God. You know, I run across people like that all the time. I ran into them in Christian college. You, know. you run into Mormons. They say, well, Jesus is a God. Our Jehovah's Witness the same way. Uh, Jesus is a created God. Uh, you know, we're all going to become gods. I mean, they try to lower Jesus. Some who put Mary on an elevation with Jesus, you know, where you pray to Mary instead of praying to Jesus. I mean, all of those are diminishing who Jesus is. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You can't miss it in that verse. And notice verse 10, the very next verse that follows it. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Nobody greater than he. You can go to the highest echelon of angelic beings, and no one is greater than he. He is not Michael the archangel, as some of the cults teach. He has the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in him bodily in whom, and we are in him, we are in him, you're in Christ, in whom are ye also circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And then we get down here to verse 15, we'll start in verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now listen what the cross did. Listen what the cross did. There was a handwriting of ordinance against us. What's Paul taking you a picture back to? He's taking you back to the cross here. So what was hanging on the cross? There was a sign at the top of the cross written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. And it said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. That was his accusation. That was what he was being crucified for. There was a handwriting of ordinance against each of the thieves who were hung next to him too. That they were thieves. Doesn't talk about that, but that's what the Romans did. They would write out, this is why we are killing this guy. And there were thousands and thousands of crucifixions in Jerusalem over a period of about 100 years. The Romans loved crucifixion. And they wanted everybody to know, if you do this, we're going to kill you. People didn't wander, wander by and say, well, I wonder why he's getting killed. They knew. Because it was nailed to the top of the cross. There was a handwriting of ordinances that was against us. It was nailed to the top of our cross. Blasphemous sinners. Filthy and vile. God-haters. Wicked people. They deserve hell. You know, so it says that he, the, Jesus did for us here. It says he blotted out the handwriting of the ordinances that were against us. He took them out of the way. And he nailed them to his cross. That's what Jesus did for you and that's what Jesus did for me. All those things that were written against us. In God's book of condemnation, he blotted them out. He took them out of the way. He nailed them to his cross. That's what he did when he died for you. Every evil thought, word, motive, action, and attitude, he blotted them out. He took them away. He nailed them to his cross.
Everything you've ever done are doing now or will do. He nailed it to his cross. And you know what that accomplished? It spoiled the principalities and the powers and he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That's verse 15. Jesus defeated the devil at the cross. And all those things that the devil could pull up and dredge up against you, Jesus blotted them out. He took them out of the way. He nailed them to his cross. And he spoiled the principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly. He openly showed they had no power. He triumphed over them in it. Now, I know we're going through the wilderness wanderings and the sins of Israel, but every one of the principles that we find in those ten points of rebellion are defined for us theologically and spiritually in the New Testament. The New Testament constantly makes reference back to the pictures God gave us in the Old Testament. Those were all historic events. But God in his sovereignty caused those events to happen and to be written down so that we would have examples not to follow the same wickedness that they followed. And the one we're looking at, of course, is spiritual warfare. Now that term, principalities, is used not only of the angelic realm, both good and bad. It's also used of an order of echelon of authority in the human realm. Paul uses it that way, for example, in Titus chapter 3, where we find it used of humans ordained to governmental power and authority. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, and that's our word, principalities, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. We have a responsibility to be in submission to powers that are ordained by God. That's Romans chapter 13. You've heard me preach on Romans 13, so I won't go over that again here. But Romans chapter 13 tells us that God is the one who ordains authority and power, those who are in governmental positions in this world. You say, but what about bad governments? Yes, God does that for other purposes. One of which, as we've been discussing in the book of Revelation, is the purification of the church, as we saw when we were looking at the church at Smyrna. Well, the next word is powers, but our time is up. I just see that on the clock here, so we'll close there. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you for the privilege of being involved as those whom the great commander-in-chief, our Lord Jesus Christ, has called into his service. You've given to each one of us different responsibilities. There are different levels of authority in every governmental structure, every military structure. There are different types of things that we do. You've gifted us each differently with the spiritual gifts. And none of us are exactly the same because you have specific points of reference to which we are attached, whereby you have called us to be your witnesses. Father, we thank you for that. The body is not all an eye. The body is not all an ear. The body is not all a hand. The body is not all a foot or a nose. But you have put the body together in such a way that under its head, the Lord Jesus Christ, we might most perfectly accomplish and fulfill that which you have ordained as your purpose for this world. And by that, through the church, you are teaching all of the angelic hosts at every echelon of power. You're teaching them your purpose. You're teaching them your wisdom. You're teaching them your grace. You're teaching them your sovereignty that you can take the weakest of instruments and accomplish infinite good for those who are your elect and infinite glory for yourself. We praise you. We thank you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.